Master Gardeners and I and a couple of my fellow Master Gardeners are here today to talk about pollinator plants. Um, first we're going to have uh, Tony Turner talk about the different kind of pollinators. Well, actually Marta's going to go first. She's going to talk about our ecosystem and then talk about some of the top 25 plants for um, attracting pollinators in our area. And then Tony Turner is going to talk about the different pollinators you may see if you if you do plant these flowers and different things that we're going to talk about that attract the pollinators, some different things you might see in your garden. And then I'm going to finish up by talking about some pollinator plants you might not think about when you think about pollinator plants, some things that are very vital and essential to have in a pollinator space that may not be kind of the run-of-the-mill things that you think about. And then I'm also going to talk about some of the top 25 pollinator plants. So we're going to start with Marta, who is going to talk about our ecosystem and some pollinator plants. Okay, this might not be as fun as looking at plants, but I think it's equally important. Um, I want to talk to you about the definition of an ecosystem. As a six-year-old in the first grade, I, was, I had the lead line in the play. And my line was, and I remember it to this day, I am Mother Earth, and there are so many wonderful things around me, such as birds and trees and <laughs> flowers. And I was dressed in a brown skirt, and I had a Girl Scout green beanie on my head that I was representing a tree. So that was my first introduction to an ecosystem. I appreciated uh, the birds and the trees. I wasn't quite aware of how intertwined everything was so so that's my six-year-old definition but I'm going to give you the college definition right now um, it's native plants that naturally evolve without intervention and they develop over thousands of years this ecosystem develops to support the survival of pollinators insects birds mammals and other wildlife that that system evolved over thousands of years, I just find fascinating. It doesn't, doesn't change without something interfering with it. These systems, these ecosystems are affected by climate, weather, soil, the uh, features, the land features and uh, water features. It's interdependent and the flow of energy from the living to the non-living components within that system are continuous. So you've got this operating, you know, the, the plants green out, they're deciduous, they fall to the ground, those leaves add uh, compostable material to the system and it goes round and round and round. North Carolina has three different regions, we, and they're what you would expect, the mountains, the Piedmont, and the coastal plain. Uh, some native plants may exist in all three. Uh, a dandelion exists in all three. It may be a little bit different uh, based on the conditions it's growing under, but they exist in all three. The Venus flytrap, on the other hand, only exist in the coastal plain and down in the southern part of it. People buy them and they keep them in their home to control the conditions they live in, but they would not survive here in the Piedmont or the mountains. <clears throat> uh, the other thing that I was surprised at is there are 30 different communities of plants in this state. Um, and they, they have um, similar bacteria, uh, fungi, animals, and plants. Um, they, from what I can tell, they seem to be identified by the tree that is the dominant feature in that uh, ecosystem. So there's a clue if you're looking about it. It's kind of hard to navigate that, but, but we do have 30 different regions in this uh, uh, not regions, communities in this state. Um, if you're looking for similarities across the country, and I find this fascinating, uh, the EPA has maps 
that identify regions in the country that have different ecological features. I'll pass this around so you can look at it. But I want you to notice that North Carolina has similar features to uh, maybe the Ozark Mountains. Yeah. Can you show it here? Oh, yeah, I'm going to show it. And um, the uh, Northwest. So uh, that was. And there are different levels of um, detail on these maps. There's four different levels, but this is the third one. Uh, so I'll pass that around. You can have a quick look at it if you want to. And the uh, website's on the top. So we have seen that uh, ecological systems are inter inter interdependent and have balance. So our question is, we want to maintain it. How do we do it? Well, we should strive to include native plants in our gardens. And um, the type of cultivars and hybrids that we buy are often uh, bred with a native to produce a different uh, bloom, a different uh, color. Um, and I'm attracted to a lot of these cultivars. If it's a peach colored plant, I gotta have it. You know, if it's, uh, I, I'm particularly fond of blue because it looks good at my hats, you know. Uh, it's a cultivar, it's not native. Um, and I even have invasive things in my house too <laughs> for different reasons, but um, it's always good to have a native plant in your landscape and in your garden. Uh, like I said, I'm a sucker for a peach color. I'm also a sucker for a double blossomed uh, plant, the uh, daylilies. That's my weakness. Uh, I'm, I'm a sucker for that. Uh, but the double blossoms may be difficult for the pollinators to extract, extract the nectar from. So, uh, you know, I have to think about that. And I walked out of my back door yesterday and there was a double daylily from the last century, early in the last century. And down in that double blossom was a little, little tiny yellow fritillary that was trying to get nectar out of it. And I thought, there's my lesson. You know, it may, they may not all work for the pollinators. <clears throat> Okay, so we've talked about how cultivars, you know, are wonderful of colors and blossoms and they've been uh, crossbred from natives. There's a darker side to our landscape and that is invasive plants. And I want to preach that today. I've got them in my yard and I've got them there intentionally, uh, but uh, sometimes they can go over to the dark side and be the worst uh, nemesis. Uh, they are termed invasive when they outcompete um, local plant species, uh, and this can cause environmental and e economic damage in the ecosystem. It can damage agriculture and it can damage your uh, home landscape. We all know about kudzu, uh, introduced in the 50s for erosion control in the south. And between Rutherfordton and Green Hill, going toward Lake Lure, <laughs> there is a kudzu uh, field that you just wouldn't believe. It's overtaken the house that was there when I was a kid. Uh, and, you know, it's not getting any better. Uh, things that you can do to uh, combat that, and I hope you don't have to, I hope it's not your, your battle to fight, um, rent a goat, you know, to kill the young foliage. And uh, if you can uh, disrupt the photosynthesis cycle, you have a chance of maybe knocking it down a bit. Um, <clears throat> many of the plants that we now have, uh, in our landscape, they've been brought here intentionally. Um, their problem in our ecosystem uh, is that the system can't adjust to this. Uh, 
um, so they outcompete the native plants and they disrupt the uh, birds and the wildlife. In that kudzu field, I don't think you'll find a deer, you know. Uh, maybe that's a good thing for you. I don't know. I got deer eating my plants. I'm not real happy with them right now, but but uh, they disrupt the, the wildlife. The wildlife can't navigate that. Um, and so when all that uh, kudzu comes down, it probably changes the pH of the soil. That's a different plant than we're used to seeing here. And uh, maybe its pH is different. As it decomposes, then it may disrupt the soil conditions and it could just wreck the whole ecosystem. Um, it reduces the biodiversity. That's what I want you to get in, in mind. Um, and it could, that can um, affect the food chain by reducing the pollinators, you know? And we really can have a crisis. Uh, if we don't have pollinators, we don't have food. And we, we think we can control it um, all the time. Uh, bees and butterflies are your major pollinators and, and then you got wind and about seven or eight others but but those are the major ones and you disrupt that and we could have a collapse so here's my word to you Let's make sure I've got everything um, I wanted to talk to you about the yeah the highly invasive ones I brought some examples today. I brought them in a plastic bag and I will take them home in a plastic bag and return them to my yard. Uh, these are invasive. They've outcompeted other um, plants in our ecosystem. They take up valuable um, resources. Anybody know what this is? It's a privet hedge, a Chinese privet hedge. When I grew up, there was a like an 18 foot hedge behind my bedroom window of this. And uh, I didn't like it because those birds woke me up in the morning. Uh, I was walking my back of my yard yesterday and I found one that has gotten very large in my yard. It's coming down uh, with my reciprocating saw. I'm gonna cut it off at the knees. I'm gonna um, drill holes in the trunk and I'm going to put herbicide in there, either uh, concentrated Roundup or 2,4-D. 2,4-D will take it out, but I'm going to get it off of my property uh, because these little ones are sprouting up. So you know about Chinese privet, you know about kudzu, ah, here's my other battle, English ivy. I have this at my lake cottage. I did not put it in my yard. It came from somewhere else. I've been fighting this battle for four years. Uh, I tried Roundup, it didn't touch it. I've later learned that probably concentrated, a little bit heavier, heavier concentration might have helped. Uh, but I've got it on the ropes this year and I'm so proud. <laughs> and I, if you've got this, I wanna tell you what to do. Uh, when the plant uh, leaves out in the spring, these little tiny uh, leaves come on and they don't have the wax on them that the mature leaves from an earlier season have. If you hit it with herbicide in the spring before it gets that waxy coat, you can put it on the ropes. Now, it might not kill it. Uh, I'm not sure of that because when I sprayed the little leaves, um, it started, you know, scrunching up like it was dying, it was dying. But because we had so many mature leaves that were able to photosynthesize efficiently, if I see it dying, I pull it up, okay? But don't leave it on the ground. It might come back, you know? Uh, if I could burn it, I would, but I have it in a controlled bin so it doesn't spread. But anyway, that's the way to get rid of English ivy. It's a battle worth fighting. Johnson grass is a grass that looks like the um, the head on it looks sort of like the top of a wheat plant. 
and it's invasive here in, in uh, North Carolina. Um, Canada thistle is, and that breaks my heart because I love thistle and I have one in my yard and it's staying there, okay, because I have an emotional attachment to that plant. Uh, there's a grass called Japanese stilt grass that is invading the forest floors. It, it's sort of a, it's a little blade that comes up and it sort of fans out like a fern and it's maybe about that high and it's affecting their woodlands. So um, if you have that kind of area around your house, you might want to be on the lookout for that. Japanese honeysuckle. It came here. We loved it. I remember pulling that little stamen out as a kid and licking the nectar off of that plant, you know, but it can be um, invasive. Um, there's a multi-floral rose that uh, is invasive. Um, I'm not really sure what that refers to, but I suspect that it's those wild roses that you see on the side of the road. Um, I remember seeing them in New England and thinking, oh, how neat that is, and people having sort of a mixed reaction to it. So that, that can be invasive. Iliagnus is another one. Um, there we, we had cultivars here for a while, uh, and I've got one that has something that has sprung up in my yard that looks like Iliagnus. Uh, it's got silvery, silvery, silvery leaves in the fall, okay? Uh, and it, it appears to be spreading, so it's going to go be happy somewhere else uh, as soon as I can get to it. There's a vine called Oriental Bittersweet <coughs> that uh, is listed as invasive in North Carolina. It's got orange and red berries on it in the fall. And I have a, um, a vine also at my lake place that looks very similar, but I've never seen berries on it. So I'm not sure it's the same plant, but it, if I had not realized it was in my dogwood tree, it would have taken over. It was up in the top of that tree and it could have stopped the photosynthesis of that tree and, and killed it. So we've gone in and we've cut it out uh, from the ground and we cut it out like 20 inches above and it did die back. It's still in there, it has a briar on it, we can't pull it out. But we have stopped it from growing in that tree and we have saved that tree. And that tree was very important to uh, my landscape because the roots of that tree stopped erosion. So that's probably that. Okay, then the other one that I wanna tell you about is Bradford pears. Um, man, what a pretty tree when it comes out in the spring. Uh, but we've learned, and I guess we've had them probably 40 years now, um, that they're prone to splitting. They, people put them out, they don't prune them, they get too much weight and they split, okay? Which creates a problem. But something else has happened with Bradford pears. I say they've gone rogue on us. Um, that Bradford pear um, will pollinate with another pear and the birds, you know, will do that and they will eat part of that plant and run out to rest in the um, side yards or in along the roadsides and trees are developing that look like Bradford pears, um, but they have thorns on this long. It's a rogue plant that has um, hybridized with the Bradford pear. My son is a pilot and he called me one day and said, Mom, I saw the prettiest um, dogwood grove flying into Charlotte. And I was standing there and looked out my window. My dogwood wasn't doing anything. I'm not sure that's a dogwood. Uh, and next time, I went out, I drove by what I consider a Bradford pear thicket, and it was in full bloom. So I told him, I said, you know what? I'm sorry to tell you that was not a dogwood. It was a Bradford pear, rogue Bradford pear thicket, okay? 
so he got a lesson in uh, ecosystems that day. Watch those bread repairs if you have them. Um, they're, they're not my favorite. Um, okay, so there's some plants that are on a watch list. And if you go on North Carolina uh, invasive plants, you'll see the list of invasive plants and you'll also see a watch list. And these are on my watch list. Nandina, uh, I have kept Nandina in my yard for years thinking that the birds like the berries. Not so, they're poisonous uh, and they're invasive. They are spreading. I have put them out intentionally for a screen, but they do spread. And you know, if you can contain them, it's okay. But if they get out of hand, you're gonna have to take action quickly. I just ask you, to be on the lookout for Nandina going rogue on you. Vinca, which I have intentionally in my yard because I don't want this. And Vinca, or my mother called it periwinkle, it will not climb a tree, it'll stay as a ground cover. I um, got rid of a lot of my turf grass and I put that in as a ground cover. Um, but it can, it can be invasive, but so far mine's well contained, but watch that one. Um, there's some question about butterfly bushes, uh, whether or not they are worth, uh, how I say this, worth the real estate they take up. And if they are of great nutritional value to the pollinators. We don't know the answer to that but I do ask you to, to watch your butterfly bushes and make sure they stay within bounds. We have some at the uh, extension office that we put there, and every year we have to go out and whack them down uh, to about chest high. They're beautiful, and I love them, and they're a nice color, you know? <laughs> but you do have to watch them. I've got, I've had one called Miss Molly that's named after my granddaughter, so I'm attached to that one. Uh, but do watch the uh, butterfly bushes. Mimosa trees, a lot of people dislike them. I love them. I had one in my yard as a kid. I thought it was the prettiest tree that was in bloom. And then there was a sort of a blight or something that went through about 40 years ago. And a lot of the mimosas are gone. You still see them on the, um, on the roadside, but they are to be watched. They are suspect. Uh, I have a lemon balm in my backyard that grows to be, can be a shrub about this high. I keep it because I make tea out of it in the summertime. It's a great tasty tea and it does not have caffeine so I can drink it all day. But it's taken up real estate that I could put a better plant in. So my project this summer is to move that from the full sun in the backyard and put it where it won't be so happy and spread so rapidly uh, in my yard. Um, there are lots of options for plants that can perform nicely in your yard and foster pollination. Um, I want you to think about when you're planting your, your gardens and your yards, I want you to think about biodiversity and try to have a mix. Don't forget the native plants. They're not weeds. They grew up here. They've been here longer than we have. They're indigenous to our region and uh, try to incorporate those. And as you buy those lovely cultivars, which I know you will, um, please pledge to pay attention and notice if something is getting out of bounds uh, because the quicker you can get on it, the less likely you'll have to do war over something like this, okay? Well, I'm glad to see all of you here today. You, you, you and I have something in common, obviously. We love plants and pollinators. Um, I became a master gardener in 2018 that was on my one of my bucket list items you know um, I have I was working a six month uh, notice at my job and the course came up and I asked my boss can I use my vacation time to take this course because if I don't then I'm gonna have to wait another year 
and I don't want to wait another year. And he said, I would rather you wait until you retire. And I said, or I could move my retirement date up. And he said, oh, oh, okay, you go ahead, you go ahead. So I used my uh, vacation time. It was, <laughs> it was that important to me. And like Marta said, she had a childhood experience that caused her to love flowers and be aware of the ecosystem. I did too. I, live, I was raised primarily by my grandparents. And when my mom remarried, we moved. All, I moved off of the farm from my grandparents. And I was so sad because I always helped my papa off plant. So he loaded me up with some seeds. And, and I took my seeds. And when I got to my new house, I planted them because they had just plowed the field, what I thought, and I planted my seeds, and um, we were moving into a new development, and actually they had plowed to plant grass, and so the people that were moving in let my seeds grow up, and so it was watermelon and turnips and all kinds of stuff, so I've just always had that desire to plant something. I particularly like to plant seed, I like to propagate things. And so my idea of to become a master gardener is not that I become all knowing, but just, just to put me in that environment, to know more, to be with people that knew more, to be able to um, do uh, field trips with people and just have a lot of fun and then get back to the community like what we're doing today. So our class today is on, it, it was titled Busy Bees. And I thought that that was just perfect because when you think about pollination, what do you think about bees? Are bees our only pollinators? Nope. Nope. And in, right there, and in particular, there. when you think about bees, which bee do you think about? Honeybees. Mm. Honeybees. And did you know that honeybees are not native to the United States? They were brought in about 400 years ago. So, and you know, they're having the colony collapse syndrome or whatever now, and people really weren't concerned so much about other kind of pollinators until the honeybees started collapsing. And then everybody got more mindful of what's going on. But before we go into meeting some of the other pollinators, let's, let's make sure, it, and I, I'm sure you do, but let's make sure everybody here knows what pollination is. I mean, I'm not gonna take that for granted that everybody knows. Pollination occurs, and this is a definition from Master Gardener, when uh, pollen grains from a flower's, flowers, I'm, I'm from the south, flowers, male parts, are moved to a female's parts, the stigma of the same species. And then when that pollen grain hits that female part, it, the, the pollen grain grows the tube and it gets down to the area, to the ovary, where pollination can occur. And then you can get fruit and from that seeds. But that has to happen on most of our flowering plants. It has to happen by some type of animal or insect. There's some plants that self-pollinate. Do you know which ones those are? Anybody? Tomatoes? Tomatoes self-pollinate like you you know, I get real anxious when my tomatoes aren't blooming in the springtime and I'll walk by and just shake them a little bit. Like, How are you today, honey? <laughs> Will you make me some babies? <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we can interact and there's, uh, there's other plants too. I think peach trees don't have to have pollinators, but most of the others do. So let me ask you, smart people here. So when, flower, when flowers get pollinated too early in the spring, where do they go? Plant parenthood. That's where they have to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's meet a few of our pollinators. Now, we've already talked about the honeybee, but worldwide, there are 100,000 animals or insects that are considered pollinators. Um, 1,500 of those are vertebrates, animals, um, that help pollinate plants. And we don't think about that. We just think about the insects. Um, we have a lady here that's uh, selling honey today. And it made me study a little bit more about honeybees because I didn't know a whole lot. Are any of you honeybee experts? 
here, I didn't realize that process about honeybees. And they're one of our primary pollinators. And the, one of the reasons that they're so popular in pollinating is because farmers can get that queen bee and get the hive and they can take it to their orchard and they can put it in there. With our native bees, we can't do that with the other pollinators, but with the honeybees, we can't. And like I said, when the colony collapsed, the disease started and they started looking at other ways that we could attract other types of pollinators to, to um, our landscapes and to our agriculture. So, honey, what are honeybees mostly interested in? Are they? They're actually mostly interested in the nectar. They get pollen on them, but they're interested in the nectar. They have little nectar pockets inside their bellies and they're getting that. This is what I studied. This led me to, to do this. So they're taking the nectar from the flower, but they're getting pollen on them. So if they go from flower to flower, they're pollinating something, but primarily by accident, they don't really mean to be doing that. They're taking that nectar back to the hive and they're spitting it into the mouth of a, another bee. And then they do that back and forth until it gets the right consistency. And then they put it in the honeycomb. And then they flap their little wings to seal it off and dry it. So they're workers, but they're not, and they get all the credit for being the top pollinator, but they're actually not our best, best pollinator. And I love, like I said, I love that she titled this course, Busy Bees, because we all need to be educated to take care of all of the pollinators. There's not one that's more important. There might be a few of these, but they're just as important in the ecosystem because of what they provide in other stages of their life. Um, and the, what I read, it says that a, um, a visit by a native bee, and that's our bumblebees and our carpenter bees and all of those, is actually more, more effective because they're actually gathering pollen on them. They have some little pollen packets. So I've noticed this week in my garden, my primary pollinators right here in my, in my garden and on my flowers are the bumblebees. They're just working, they're down in those squash plants. I rarely see any honeybees. But I live through the cornfield. I drive my Polaris over here and I live through the cornfield over there and they spray that cornfield, I'm sure, for insects, uh, for whatever. <laughs> and so that's taking the honeybees off of my property, a lot of the pollinators. But the, the native bees are surviving. So, um, One example of a very, very important little bee is a blueberry bee. Do any of you grow blueberries or have any orchard plants? A blueberry bee, and this, I wanna tell you how important he is. Um, this was one example that they had done a study. In a lifetime of this little bee, he pollinates about 50,000 flowers, which ends up producing 6,000 blueberries which at the market sells for $20. So that one little bee is very, very valuable. So we want to take care of him and other pollinators. pollinators. There's 4,000 different uh, species of native bees. I brought a little pamphlet that's got some information on it. You're welcome to look at it. So there's, just look, that little tiny sweat bee that you see, he is a workhorse. He is going from flower to flower to flower to flower. He is pollinating like crazy. Um, of course, we like butterflies. How many of you like butterflies? I love butterflies. And I am I'm right now on a campaign to bring back the monarchs. So I'm trying to plant things in my landscape that will uh, feed them and bring them back. And they're not as good a pollinators as the bees or the native bees, but they pollinate plants when they're when they get it on their legs and they move from plant to plant then they're taking it taking that those pollen grains and putting it in different places and lots of times 
if you have an abundance of butterflies in your landscape, that's a real good indication that you have a healthy ecosystem because you have the right balance. You've got some bees, and then you've got your uh, your food there because not only the butterflies in their other stages, they provide food for uh, birds, you know, so I think there was one thing that I read that said that uh, chickadees and the average lifespan of a pair of chickadees to raise a little nest of babies that they have to eat 6,000 or bring 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to their young. And so where do the caterpillars come from? Those butterflies that you have. So the butterflies are not, maybe not as good a pollinators, but they're contributing to the whole ecosystem. As I said, one thing is not more important than the, the other. So, um, how many of you know, know what where the little social bees live? Or what's the difference in social bees? and um, Social bees are bees that probably we've had some of those in here today. They're not honey bees. They're not very territorial. They're not going to try to sting you if you walk up to them, unless you smush one of them. Um, they live in twigs, hollow twigs, like in the wintertime when you cut back your your um, things on your property. If you have some little twigs that they can go down, they go in those little twigs and lay their eggs there in the fall and so that their eggs will hatch out in the summertime. I have, a, I have my grandkids build a little nest for the native bees and it's got all different sizes of little holes in there and we hung it up and painted it bright yellow and sure enough there's there's places where they've uh, gone in there and they've sealed it off they've laid their eggs in there and then in the springtime we can watch when she breaks open and the, and the babies start coming out so do things like that put put things on your property that attract different types of pollinators so, do those little bee houses really, those are effective? That you can buy like at wherever? You know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering if it was yeah, and hyper. Do some research too on native bees. You'll be amazed at what you find. Well, oh, I think my, my porch uh, railings are <coughs> home to a lot of wood bees. So. Right. Well, carpenter, carpenter bees, yeah. yeah, carpenter bees are a nuisance. Yeah. yeah. But they are a good pollinator. Yeah. I have I, read, I be. <laughs> in studying for this, I read that they do not like citric smells, like that spray, mm. citric smells, and they do not like loud noises. <laughs> so put a loud radio out there for about three days in the spring when they're mm -hmm. doing all that, and they'll move away. Huh. They'll move away, but they're good pollinators oh, yeah. if you can tolerate them. They love my, my butterfly bushes. Oh yeah. Yeah, so you've got your bumblebees, your carpenter bees, your digger bees, your leaf cutter bees, your little sweat bees. Um, my, um, like I said, my thing this year was the monarchs and the providing food for them. How many of you know that monarchs only lay their eggs in a lot of butterflies and a, uh, only lay their eggs on certain plants? And if they can't find that certain plant, then they can't lay their eggs there they lay their eggs there and when the larvae hatch out then the they they the little caterpillars eat that plant up and then they they may crawl away to make their their little chrysalis and then they'll fly away after that but if there's not those host plants there butterfly weed not a butterfly bush but butterfly leaf weed there's different types of it is a great thing to put in your landscape and watch. Your kids will absolutely watch. There'll be a teeny tiny little egg will be on the back side of the leaf and you can watch and this real pretty yellow and black and white caterpillar will come out and it will eat every part of that plant. It's little seed pods look like okra and it'll eat the okra, it eats the leaves, it eats the stems and they'll be happy and then they'll crawl off and do their little thing, the chrysalis. So let's see what I have not told you in my little bit. A wasp. How many of you like wasps? I don't like wasps, but they're good pollinators. 
Um, they can live not near my house, not near my door, um, but they are good pollinators and we have to respect the, the job that they do. There's also parasitic wasps. You know what that is? It, it is a native, a parasitic wasp. Have any of you ever had a tomato plant that had one of those green hornworms on it? Well, a parasitic wasp likes to lay her eggs in that green horn worm. And when the, the larva come out, then they eat the worm. If you ever find a green horn worm and it's got these little white spikes sticking out of it, you'll know that a really good white um, parasitic wasp lays her eggs in there. So that's a really plant friendly, environmentally friendly um, pollinator to have in your landscapes. Um, and then some wasps do good, they collect yeast in some of the grape growing business and it depends on where they collect it from, the nectar. They put in the yeast, it affects the different tastes. So we have little smart pollinators, but the, the predatory wasps that will attack you, they're really, really smart. I read that they even have facial recognition. They recognize, have you ever got stung by one and you can't get away from it because it's gonna find you. If you're in a crowd, it's gonna find you because it remembers your face. They remember each other's faces. But they uh, they work in a, a colony to take care and they're real territorial. Moths, think about moths being pollinators. They work primarily at night. There's 11,000 species in the United States alone. They outnumber butterflies 10 to one but we don't think about them because they work at night. But there's one moth that works during the day, you know, which one he is. Yes. Yeah, a hummingbird moth. You look at it and you think, is that a hummingbird? But you're so close up on it and it's real tiny, but a hummingbird moth, it is a wonderful pollinator. Beetles. Ever think about beetles being good pollinators? No, we, they just get the bad rap for laying eggs and leaving <coughs> mess all over our plants. But they're actually good pollinators. They're pretty clumsy. They don't mean to pollinate, but they're, you know, just crawling around in there, kind of drunkenly. And they're taking that pollen from plant to plant when they go. Flies. I mean, flies. How many of you like flies? How many of you like chocolate? You better go watch a video on how we get our chocolate. You'll like flies because flies really help us get chocolate. Y'all <laughs> go look that up. I'm not gonna tell you everything. Birds. Birds are great pollinators because they're on their plant on that plant, and um, they're sh especially the ones that that are self-pollinated. They move, you know, move the plant around. The wind self-pollinates, moves it around, and then people uh, do that. So, what can we do to protect our pollinators? Plant more plants for them. Yes, plant more plants for them. What else? Don't use pesticides. That's a big, big, big. What do we get from, the, what kind of plants are we gonna plant? Natives, yeah. And on that list right there that I gave you, that's from North Carolina um, Extension website. And it's got the top, some of the top 25 plants that, and it, it's got their bloom time. And Pines has so nicely put some other pollinators and they separated in the summer and spring and fall. So that's all, that's all in here. All these are pollinators. And then I noticed that when we came in that there were some pollinators out there. The pollinators are pollinators and our native plants have this relationship. And that's what we want to help. We want to give them what they need. We want to give our pollinators the food that makes them the healthiest and helps our ecosystem. So even if you can't afford to, to put a whole pollinator garden in your yard all at one time, which I can't, start getting some plants that are native and pollinators and putting them in there. And you will watch and see if, if your vegetables don't do better if you're, um, I mean, it's everything. One thing contributes to another. 
So, and we think about flowers when we think about pollinators, but actually it's trees and shrubs, flowers, we have a lot of different things. And you wanna provide nesting habitat for those bees. Um, I've got, everybody got a cell phone? Pull out your cell phone right now. I'm gonna let you play on your cell phone this way. I want you to look at that list because I'm supposed to tell you, but I, on the essence of time, I'm not going to do that. Um, look at that list and look up uh, th that first one, I think, Aquisius tuberosa. You can spell that. Wait a minute. Back up. Can you do something first? Type in Google search. Plant, P-L-A-N-T, space toolbox and go and you're going to get a picture of some toolboxes but right down under that you're going to get North Carolina what? Somebody found it? Yes, plant toolbox. Now type in in that little search bar on the plant toolbox when you find it the name of that butterfly weed plant that I told you. This one right here. Yeah, type in this right here. Can we identify the plant? That's one. Or we can okay. When you're visiting a nursery and you want to know more about a plant, you want to know how tall it's going to get. Does it need sun? Does it need shade? Can it live in both? How much moisture does it need? Everything that you ever wanted to know about a plant is in, in that database. And if there's a plant missing, all you have to do is let us know and we will try to find that plant and get it in there. But it is a wonderful resource tool for you and me. Because everybody thinks that a master gardener is supposed to know everything. I don't. I kind of get white when you say, when they say, can you tell me what this plant is? No, I can't. <laughs> I can't. I am not all-knowing. I, I wish I was. I'm not all-knowing. But what, I think what, um, what I would like to see happen for me in my future is for me to continue on my journey to learn more about plants and the importance of our pollinators in the ecosystem and to figure out what we're supposed to do here on earth. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to care for each other. We're supposed to care for the things of the earth. And this is how, this is one way that we can all start. You about, um some different kind of things besides flowers that you're gonna want in your yard in order to have a good pollinator garden. Who can tell me the single most important plant for a pollinator garden? Tree. What kind of tree? You see, I loaded my, my audience with somebody who already knew the answer to my question. <laughs> and I pulled this out of my flower garden this morning, an oak tree. And as you see, this is what this becomes. Isn't nature fabulous? And I don't know how I got lucky enough to pull this out. I guess because somebody knew I was coming here today to talk to y'all and thought, wouldn't that be neat if I showed an oak tree in its baby form? Then you have the adult form. Oak trees support over 500 species of insects as a host plant. What a host plant means is that they are going to eat it. Most oak trees, I can't tell in my yard that anything's eating my oak trees, but there are. So if you want to have a good pollinator yard or part of pollinator property, you need oak trees. It also helps, like Tony said, feed the birds because I have lots of birds in my yard. They're looking for these caterpillars and worms and all these larval stages. So you not only want to have all these beautiful flowers that they've so kindly pulled out here for us, it's really pretty. You also want to have your foundation plants be things that are also good for pollinators. That's going to be trees. I mentioned the oak tree. Willow trees, over 450 species of pollinators. You've got the cherry and your plum trees. I knew trees. I needed a willow tree, Mike. You 
do. And they're beautiful. Not close to your who doesn't, yeah, who doesn't want a willow tree in their yard? We've got seven acres. I know it can go this way. <laughs> and then we also have birch, poplar, and pines. All of these trees are excellent host plants for our pollinators. We don't have host plants. They have nowhere to grow up. They're not going to survive. Okay. In addition to feeding the birds, that's why they have so many eggs and so many babies is because maybe only 10% survive being eaten by the birds, but that 10% grows on to be our butterflies and our beautiful things we see. I'm not, I don't think worms and caterpillars, well, some of them are beautiful, but they're not all as attractive as we think of butterflies and some of the other things, but we've got to have these base foundation plants for everything to grow. You want to choose, like I think we've already mentioned, native varieties. I have several Japanese maples in my yard. Those aren't going to be pollinator plants. Those are ornamentals. They're there to look pretty, and that's what they do. My other, my other plants are kind of going to be my workhorses. But um, a native maple tree is going to support so much more of our native life than something that's brought in from elsewhere. Um, and let's see. One thing that I've had to overcome and that I don't know what kind of gardeners you are, but if you're going to have a pollinator garden or a pollinator yard, things are going to get eaten. Leaves are not going to look beautiful and pristine and perfect. Things are going to eat that. If you don't want that and you can't accept that, you can't tolerate it, don't plant a pollinator garden because the worst thing you can do is plant this beautiful plant, attract all these wonderful insects and butterflies and bees, and then spray it with something that's going to kill them. There is no type of herbicide or pesticide that you could put on this that's not going to damage what you're trying to grow. So you're at cross purposes with yourself, right? You gotta plant things and you gotta let them, you gotta let them be. You can't baby them to death. If you want to have that perfect, beautiful garden, and I, I'm all for that, but you're really not gonna be able to have a good pollinator garden because that's the whole purpose of some of these plants. Most of these are nectar plants with the pretty flowers. Some of the plants are going to be host plants that they're going to eat. And I've had milkweed in my yard that by the end of the pollinators chewing on it, I've got one stalk and three flowers at the top. But that's what it's there for, right? It's there to feed them. So every year I plant more because that's what I want them to do. I want them to eat it and be healthy and have babies and have more butterflies and more caterpillars and more, more bees, essentially. Although bees don't necessarily have the larval stage that a lot of our butterflies and as Tony mentioned moths because moths are very very important also and Doug Tallamy is kind of one of the guys from up north that has kind of started this native and pollinator movement and a quote from his book says if you if, if nothing is eating the plants in your garden and you're doing this for pollinators then you're not doing something right because that's the whole purpose of putting them there you want them to get the nectar, you want them to eat the leaves, you want them to eat the stalks, you want them to make their nest there, you want them to have their chrysalis, have their butterfly. All that's going to come from their host plant. Now they are going to zoom around and get nectar off of different ones, but what's vitally essential is that they have their host plant. And I think on some of that plant toolbox, it actually mentions what some of those host plants are for different species. Now the oak is a, gener it's a generic host. It hosts, like I said, over 500 things, but there are certain butterflies and caterpillars they will only eat and lay eggs on certain plants so if you are looking to attract certain types of butterflies or caterpillars then you've got to plant that specific type of plant some shrubs that you might consider blueberry is always great it also attracts the bees the other pollinators spice bush buckeye mountain laurel and rhododendron which are nat native to this area those attract lots of pollinators and also for shade because most of our pollinator plants because they need to flower and produce nectar are going to grow in full sun we also have the oak leaf hydrangea which is a native to this area which is a very good pollinator plant or if you're like me and you have lots of trees you need something under those trees that are going to grow in the shade all of these things aren't going to grow in the shade okay some really good pollinator plants that i looked on your list and i was going to talk about fall but i think we're running out of time goldenrod goldenrod is beautiful beautiful dark yellow gold flowers attracts huge numbers of pollinators some people unfortunately confuse it with ragweed which causes our seasonal allergies it is not ragweed you will see goldenrod growing wild it's not necessarily ragweed if you look at the structure of the flowers it's very very different so we want goldenrod to grow in our gardens because it attracts lots of great pollinators also asters as you see they're pretty real pretty purple back there in the aster 
that's going to bloom in the sun. The great thing about asters, depending on what type you plant, some grow in the sunflower in the spring, some in the summer, and some in the fall. But you want those pollinators to have something to eat for the whole season. You don't just want to have everything bloom in the spring and then die because then you've got your pollinators are still here, but all your flowers are gone. So you need spring, summer, fall, which is why they put on that list different things you could choose for different seasons that are going to do well and feed our essential pollinators. Um, I also have a climbing aster. They don't have one of those here, and I got one of these from the native plant sale at UNCC last fall and planted it on a trellis at my mailbox. And I'm really excited to see. I've never seen one in real life, but that's how you can experiment and find things you like, find things that you don't already know something about. But it's it's already grown up the trellis about this tall. I've yet to see flowers, but it's a fall bloomer, so I won't see anything probably until September. Um, there's a couple of different organizations that you can also get information from. There's something called the Butterfly Highway, which is an a, a organization that started here in North Carolina. It's now, I think, administered by either the North Carolina Department of Natural Resources or maybe the National Wildlife Feder Federation. There's also designation as a monarch way station where if you have certain plants that attract butterflies and have certain criteria you need to meet in order to become a monarch way station. That helps our butterflies. Um, you can also do native plant habitat certification and um, wildlife habitat certification through um, the National Wildlife Federation, which is a growing. I have both of those. I have I have the native wildlife certification, but I don't have the native plant one yet. And they're a little more particular about what you have. There are certain things you absolutely cannot have, like maybe some of these invasives that we've talked about. You would have to get rid of those in your yard. There are also th certain other things you do have to have that would be beneficial to pollinators that help you get that certified native plant. Because native plants are naturally pollinators. There are some things that we're going to have here that aren't native that are also pollinators. I always love zinnias. There's also all great kinds of annuals you can put out that initial burst of color. Zinnias, uh, sunflower, alyssum, lots of different things that um, attract our butterflies and our, I, and I have never planted a patch of zinnias that it wasn't just constantly busy. Something is always there whether it's a butterfly, a moth, a sweat bee, a bumblebee, a native bee, something is always in those zinnias so it's a great food source. It's not a host plant for anything. It's not native to our area but it does help give them some food and give something that attracts them to your yard. Do y'all have any questions about anything? I encourage you to browse around. They've pulled all of our pollinator plants up here for everybody to look at. We've got summer, spring, fall um, that you can look at and see if there's anything you're interested in. Look on your plant toolbox to see if it's somewhere it'll grow in your yard because you're gonna need to also know shade versus sun before you choose a plant to plant, which is what I always look at first is it going to grow in the shade of the sun because I want it in a bright sunny spot and I get a shade plant we're not going to do so good are we so those are some things to think about as you're choosing your selections also as we as consumers ask for more of these native plants and pollinator plants garden centers like this realize that they can sell them they can't they can't have plants that don't sell so the more you buy these plants the more you ask for these plants the more we'll have these plants available for us to have locally to buy and we won't have to go to some other nursery some so far away we can help our local community uh merchant merchandise stores and stuff too so anybody have any questions for me or marta or tony